good morning, uh, good afternoon. Uh, we have uh, Professor Tani Kling with us to deliver the third plenary talk of the conference. Uh, welcome, Tan. Uh, Professor Aikling will be talking to us today on issues related to educational accessibility and uh, policies in STEM education. She will share with us details of programs that have been implemented in Singapore to act, increase accessibility to STEM teachers' professional development and to build a sustainable STEM ecosystem through partnerships between schools, tertiary institutions, and industries. Tan is an associate professor and deputy head at National Institute of uh, Education, Singapore, NIE Singapore. She's also a core team member with the Multicentric Education Research and Industry STEM Center at NIE. Her research focus on the scholarship of science teaching and learning, science teacher professional development and STEM education. Over to you, Tan. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, thank you also for inviting me to present at this particular conference. So good afternoon uh, to my colleagues out there. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, and to share with you some ideas related to accessibility of STEM for teachers and what is at stake. Now, in this particular conference, uh, one of the some of the key ideas that I like um, to bring across is this idea that uh, STEM education uh, needs to be, uh, teachers need to be more um, well-trained um, before STEM education can be well-taught in schools. Now, STEM education has gained a lot of attention, particularly so in the past couple of years, whereby um, many economies around the world, many curriculum around the world, have been trying to infuse this idea of particularly integrated STEM learning into schools. Um, this movement or this wave came about because, partly because of the NGSS, where they tried to introduce engineering into science curriculum. So the, the STEM ideas that I will be talking about today, um, um, it's not about science or math on its own in a monodisciplinary STEM, but rather, uh, it's integrated STEM, where I define integrated STEM as two or more of the STEM disciplines coming together um, to help students learn and apply uh, to solve problems. All right, so um, I want to talk about, I want to address and push this idea of accessibility. How accessible is this idea of integrated STEM learning for teachers as well as for students? So what are some of the tensions that we have and we see in STEM education, particularly in interdisciplinary STEM learning? First of all, the STEM learning itself is a blur concept. Now by a blur concept, we are saying that, we, are, we mean that there are multiple understanding of this notion of STEM learning. So for some people, the idea of STEM just simply means science learning or mathematics learning, or the use of technology in facilitating learning. Well, that is one aspect on the continuum of STEM definition. There is also the other form, which is integrated STEM learning, where we look at um, how we can infuse or marry two or more disciplines within a certain uh, learning experience so that we can use this knowledge to solve problems. So that is integrated STEM on the other end of the continuum. Now, regardless of the disciplines that uh, definitions that we talk about, there is a need to unpack what STEM learning is. And so because it is a blur concept, it makes teachers confused. What exactly is STEM? Because if I take the definition loosely, everything I do can be considered STEM learning. But if I'm very strict with the definition, then what exactly makes up STEM? So this idea of trying to scope what STEM education is, is one of the first tension points that um, leaders, that schools and teachers have to confront before they embark on their STEM learning journey. Secondly, there is certain expectations of teachers to implement STEM learning in our uh, classrooms. 
many, many I work with many teachers across different economies, and one of their point is, oh, you know, people, um, governments and policymakers say that we have to implement STEM, but how? What kind of STEM are we supposed to do? How do we do this? How is STEM learning different from what we are currently doing in our classrooms? So therein lies, the expectation is there, but how to go about doing that lies on the shoulders of the teachers. Um, and, and that we are trying to argue that is not very fair for the teachers. Thirdly, in many schools, um, schools are still structured in a very traditional mode where um, learning is structured by subjects, is classified by subjects. So students go to school, the schedule of school is you have, you have a math class now, you have a science class now, you have a, a, a Chinese, you have a Malay, you have a Tamil, you have English classes now. So it's still very traditional by monodiscipline subjects. So therein lies a tension point. How do you then create, create a space for integrated STEM to come into the picture? unless we create a space called integrated STEM as a subject in school. But this has yet to be seen in many parts of the world because this idea of integrated STEM is still, um, people are still trying to work it out. All right, so the traditional structure of subjects is not helping us push forward for integrated STEM. And last but not least, the issue of identity of STEM teachers. Question has been asked, are you a STEM teacher or are you a teacher of STEM subject? So for many uh, teacher training or teacher education institutions around the world, we still, we still train or we still certify disciplinary teachers. For instance, we certify science teachers, we certify math teachers, we certify English teachers. We don't, or not yet, do we certify a STEM teacher. Now, if we don't certify a STEM teacher, then who owns STEM in schools? Who is the person who is responsible for teaching STEM? And do, do, is it also fair to, to want to have subject knowledge or disciplinary knowledge of four disciplines residing in a single teacher? Should STEM therefore be taught as a team rather than dependent on one individual teacher. So you see here, these are the tensions that needs to be resolved in order for STEM education to become successful. So in our, last year, my colleagues and I got together and we talked about these tension points. And the question we asked ourselves would be, what then would help teachers uh, resolve these tensions? And the decision and the conclusion that we came up with was leadership. Leadership in schools, leadership at policy level, leadership in curriculum design. So this whole idea of leadership could be something that will help us try to resolve at some point the tensions created um, from the push for STEM, integrated STEM learning. Now, so what is the definition of leadership? Leadership is defined as a process, all right? Leadership is a process as compared with a product. It is not a product, but rather it's a process. It's a process of influence leading to the achievement of a desired purpose. So in STEM learning, what we're trying to say is there must be a desired purpose. And this desired purpose could be integrated STEM learning. It could be um, more proficient problem solvers. So we need to work out what this desired purpose is. Now, successful leaders develop a vision. So for their schools, based on their personal and professional values. So in all organizations, there will have to be a vision. So the question is, what then is the vision for STEM education? So good leaders also articulate this vision at every opportunity and influence their staff and other stakeholders to share this vision, to share this vision that integrated STEM is a promising way forward for education for the 21st century, for instance. The philosophy, structure, and activities of the school are geared towards the achievement of this of this shared vision. 
So there must be certain structures, there must be resources that are put into uh, schools to ensure that integrated STEM can take place. So the three questions that I like to leave us with this in, from this particular slide for all of us here to think about as we uh, leave this talk later, what is the desired purpose of STEM education in your own context, in your own schools, in your own classroom? What are the desired purpose? Has it been articulated? Has it been articulated clearly? If it has not been articulated, perhaps it is time that we take some time and effort to articulate the purpose. Secondly, what is the vision for STEM education? Now, this vision is important. Otherwise, no matter what we do in curriculum design, it is not going to help us achieve this vision. Now, a student once asked me in the, in the master's class that I was teaching on STEM education, and the student asked, so Prof Tan, is STEM, is integrated STEM a compound or a mixture? For the chemists among us, you would appreciate this very, very interesting question or analogy. If STEM is a compound, it will have a new property of its own, property that is different, characteristic epistemic practices perhaps, that is different from science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, right? These individual disciplines, it will be different. But if integrated STEM is a mixture, it will resemble, it will have properties of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So therein lies what exactly is STEM. And unless we know that, we cannot articulate this vision. All right, so what is the vision? Do you already know? Do I we producing a vision or is there a consolidated one? And after we have got the vision for STEM education, the next question that I like you to think about, that all of us, not I like you, we all of us need to think about is how can a shared vision for STEM education be developed? All right, and how can it be developed? Can it be developed solely by the teachers themselves? Or can it be developed, or must it be developed by a community of people coming together? Or can it be developed by strong leadership? So my colleagues and I decided to consult, consult the literature for leadership. Now there is a lot of leadership literature. All right. Um, uh, if you read um some of the leadership, more generic ones, not particular to STEM you will have things, you will come across ideas such as instructional leadership, which actually uh, talks about creating conditions within schools to foster and improve learn teaching and support students' learning. That's instructional leadership related to teaching. We talk, uh, the literature talks about distributed leadership, which is actually shared leadership, collaborative leadership, delegated leadership, or democratic leadership. That, can inf that are and can be influenced by societal and cultural values and norms. The literature also talks about teacher-level leadership. In teacher-level leadership, the teacher is involved in shared decision-making processes in schools and contribute to the professional development of others, potentially their peers. Uh, they share their expertise, they contribute to innovative ideas and have autonomy in decision-making. Now, when we, we took a leaf from these various uh, ideas of leadership and we asked ourselves the question, what then is STEM leadership or leadership for STEM schools? What does it look? Does it look different? Does it look the same? What are some of the considerations? So leadership for STEM schools, we realize, need to have three Cs. There are three Cs that needs to be considered. First C is the culture and the context collaboration, and courage to change from the comfort zone. Now, these three Cs um, can be unpacked further, which is what I'm going to go through um, in the next slide. But let me talk about why there is a need for these three Cs. Now, this for culture and context, one of the key questions we ask ourselves is that is whether integrated STEM is culturally sensitive. What this means is that 
Is integrated stamp the same here in Singapore compared with that in India, compared with that in the United States or in the UK? If it is the same, if it is universal, then culture and context is irrelevant. But what we are arguing is that because we have different needs, we have different cultural beliefs about, about our society, about what makes good learning, we believe that um, these need to be considered as well. The culture and context of our local, uh, of our society, as well as the culture and context of local schools must be considered for leadership of STEM. Okay, this could also include things like the kind of vision, the resources that's available to the schools within a specific local context. These need to be considered in STEM leadership. The second C talked about collaboration. Now, as you might have um, understood, that STEM consists of people with uh, uh, teams of people with different disciplinary um, I, uh, knowledge coming together. We have the math teacher, we have the science teacher, we have the engineering trained teachers, we have the technology trained teachers coming together to draft curriculum, to plan learning activities. This idea of collaboration is, must be very strong. Unless people know how to form teams, uh, there are diverse teams that have got different disciplinary knowledge, then STEM learning is not going to take place in a meaningful manner. So how do teachers from different disciplines collaborate? How do we take each other's strengths, understand each other's um, uh, disciplinary nuances before we can come together? One of my PhD students is studying um, the idea of border crossing, boundary crossing across for, for teachers of different disciplines trying to come together and to work together. And and one of her findings was that, uh, um, that there are key challenges because uh, we, we tend to think in a certain manner. We tend to uh, give emphasis. We tend to value different things when we have different, we come from different disciplines. So collaboration is one fundamental aspect to consider. And the, the third C that we want to advocate is this courage to change from comfort zone. <laughs> Now, why is courage important? In many uh, communities that we work with, um, people or teachers, students, parents, uh, leaders are very comfortable. Now, these disciplines existed on their own for many, many years. Let's not rock the boat. All right, so this idea of integrated or interdisciplinary teams coming together caused a lot of tension. And pretty much most of the time, um, their preference is, well, you know what? Let's not change, all right? Because change is scary. So we feel that in order for STEM to change, the leaders must have the courage to move, to move themselves, to move their teams out of their comfort zone. So with these three Cs in mind, culture and context, collaboration, courage to change from comfort zone, we propose this idea of um, three Cs. I'm sorry, I didn't realize this was blocking. We propose the three Cs model of STEM leadership. All right, three C model of STEM leadership. Well, on the vertical axis, you see that we have agency, identity, building a community. Now, in this particular table, we raise many questions. Now, these are important questions, important questions for any potential leaders to consider. So first of all, you can see under culture and context and under agency, hang on, you see one of the key questions is how do different departments make decisions? A good leader has to answer this question or try to find out how different departments, how the science department, how the math department, how the engineering department make the decision, be it decision of res for resource allocation, decisions for cur curriculum decisions, uh, manpower decisions, uh, student ex uh, assessment decisions. How do these different discipline uh, departments make these decisions? 
are they the same? Are they different? And if they are different, what are the differences? The second C of collaboration under this idea of agency, we ask ourselves this question. Who has the power to make decisions? Who has the power? Is it the principal? Is it the heads of department? Is it the teachers? Who makes the decision? Which department makes the decision? Who decides on working teams? How do teams come together? Is it very grounded decision-making where the teachers have a lot of agency or typically it is the head of department coming in and then assigning people to teams? And under courage to change for agency, are there avenues for individual STEM teacher to initiate change? So for instance, you may be very passionate about integrated STEM. Can you form a team and, and tell your, your leaders, look, I think this is going to be good. This is going to work. Let me try it out with my students. Do we have that agency? Can teachers nominate themselves to be in a STEM team? You see a team that's performing well and you think that's something of your interest. Do you have the power to nominate yourselves, to invite yourselves into the team? So that's under the agency. Questions we raise for the three C's under agency. The second point is identity. This idea of identity for contact, identity for collaboration, and identity, courage for change. Questions for culture and context that we are asking ourselves. Do teachers identify themselves as STEM practitioners? Over here in Singapore, at least, we know that our teachers still identify themselves as either science teacher or math teacher or technology teacher. No one has identified themselves as a STEM teacher. What about yourself in your community? Do, your commu do you identify yourself as STEM practitioners? Under collaboration, how are new identities of interdisciplinary teams created? This is an important question because when we want to collaborate, how do we create this identity? All right, and I think this is one of the uh, most important and probably the most challenging uh, aspects in forming new identity, be it at schools, K-12 schools, or at the university. Um, we found this to be particularly challenging at the university levels because universities are very specialized. And when we, when we advocate um, specialized disciplines, it becomes difficult to say, hey, you know what? Uh, we want it a little bit more porous. All right, so engineers will say, I'm an engineer. I've got nothing to do with the scientists. So how do we form this STEM identity? And under courage for change, we ask ourselves, are there mechanisms to recognize transient identity? I am transiting. I'm transiting from being a science educator to a STEM educator. I'm transiting from being a math teacher to a STEM teacher. Do we want to recognize this? Are there mechanisms to recognize multiple identities? If you have multiple identities, do you belong to one department or many departments? So these are questions that are still outstanding that we will, we, we try to seek answers uh, within the literature, but we, we, we weren't able to find a lot of these answers. And of course, the last one is building a, um, building a community. Building a community under culture and context, are current departments collegial in their interactions? I think this is something we, we ask ourselves a lot. How do different departments work together? Are we always happy with one another? How do different departments work? We all work differently. And what does each department value? We cannot assume that each department value the same thing. They could be different, and we need to find this out. And of course, our collaboration with industries, are there collaborations with industry or the community? Now, one of the things with culture uh, and, and context is that, um, at least in Singapore and in, in many parts of Asia, we realize that with STEM education, there needs to be deliberate collaboration with community. Uh, with, I'm sorry, with industries. Because cutting-edge knowledge related to STEM does not reside 
in the school context. The teachers themselves do not have these cutting edge knowledge. And these cutting edge knowledge of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics resides in the industry. So we need to have active and meaningful industrial partners who will be able to bring this new knowledge into our classrooms, who will be able to work with the teachers to translate and transform these knowledges that they have and bring them to the students. This will help to keep learning, all right? Learning updated, learning for our students at a cutting edge level. Under collaboration for building a community, our school schedule conducive for interdisciplinary teams to meet. This is probably one uh, uh, area that some people may perceive it to be administrative, but at the same time, it is more than being administrative. We need to have structures. We need to build in structures to enable teams to meet. So if the science teacher always, um, you know, never have a time, common time with the math teacher, how then would interdisciplinary teams come together? So how can we facilitate that to happen? Are there mentors to develop the novice STEM teachers within teams? How do we build up a mentoring um, uh, culture within teams? And are there structures for professional development in teams? So these are things that um, some, some uh, communities have all these in place, Others need to think about them. And the last one, which is courage for change, we are talking about are STEM teams inclusive? Do we have inclusive STEM teams? Or are STEM teams only for the privileged? How can STEM teams be inclusive? If we are not yet inclusive, how can we be more inclusive? And can changes in interdisciplinary teams be evaluated? Do we need to evaluate? And if we do need to evaluate, how can we evaluate? So I'd like to um, reiterate the fact that these three C models of STEM leadership throws up many questions, many questions which are fundamental and structural that needs to be considered for STEM learning to get to the students, for teachers to become effective STEM learners. So one of the things that we have done in Singapore is that we have a program. We have a program um, called the Empowering STEM Education Professional Program. This is one of the many efforts that we have put together to build an ecosystem to support STEM teachers, to support STEM learning, particularly integrated STEM learning. So the vision that we have at Mary STEM at NIE, which is a STEM education research center that was set up in 2018, one of the vision that we have is to ensure that we have the industries coming in, the teachers coming in, um, the schools coming in, as well as our partners from different parts of Asia coming in to have a dialogue to talk about some of the questions that were raised under STEM leadership so that collectively we can build a STEM, uh, an Asian STEM identity that will be, that could look the same or different from what is uh, uh, actually carried out in the West. So in this Empowering STEM Education Professionals Program, it is an annual program that we organize. All right, we, we've organized it only for two years right now, um, and we've seen good, good results and good feedback from the participants. So it's open to all teachers to participate. So therein lies what we call teacher agency. We let the teachers decide. We let the teachers decide if they want to be part of this particular program. All right, so agency is important. Choice is important for our teachers. One of the requirements to be part of the program is for teachers to work within interdisciplinary groups or interdisciplinary teams within their own school or between schools. So we also have seen teachers between schools, schools within the same cluster, schools within the same area, coming together to work together in interdisciplinary team. So here we tried to build the teacher's identity. So they no longer see themselves as, I'm a teacher from school X. I'm a science teacher from school X. No, rather their identity has become, I'm a teacher belonging to this particular STEM team. So through time, we do want them to build an identity to say, you know what, 
I'm a science teacher, but I'm also a STEM teacher or a teacher of STEM. This is where the multiple and transient identities come in. And of course, uh, we have winners. What this program does is that we open this as a competition of sorts for teachers to put in their lesson ideas. So they have to think of a problem, a STEM-related problem. They put in their ideas, the lesson plans, the lesson packages, and it will be judged by a panel of judges. The judges will pick the winners and the winners will share their ideas with others. The winners serve as what we call a center of excellence for STEM learning and they will share their ideas with others um, within the country as well as outside the country. So when they share their ideas with others, they, we are hoping to build a community, a community where we help one another improve upon these various STEM lessons. <laughs> and of course, the winners go on learning journeys to share their ideas with teachers internationally. So we have several projects with, um, say, Bangkok in Thailand. We have projects with uh, our partners in Indonesia. So our teachers will, Singapore teachers will visit um, our Indonesian teachers, our Thai teachers, to share their lesson ideas. We run similar programs in Thailand and in um, uh, Indonesia as well. So they will also come to Singapore. Now, one of the things that we noticed was that the problems that were shared, the lesson ideas that were shared, look different, which is, which is the cultural and uh, context sensitivity of STEM learning. For instance, in Singapore, we, have, uh, we look at the problem of sustainable food supply. All right, Singapore being a very, very small country um, that has got no natural resources, we are dependent on a lot of um, our friends from other countries to import food into our country, to give us um, you know, fuel, et cetera, et cetera. So sustainable food supply is a big issue for us. And it becomes even more acute um, um, as, as, uh, evol as the pandemic evolves. All right, so one of the STEM problems that we talk about a lot in our country is sustainable food supply. So like this year, the theme is uh, uh, edible landscapes. How can we grow food for, to feed ourselves? Last year, we talked about clean energy. All right. Now, our colleagues in Indonesia, for instance, our friends in Indonesia, their problems are more local. They talk about buildings, buildings that can withstand earthquakes. Now, this is something which our Singaporean teachers and students won't think about simply because there are no earthquakes here in Singapore. So we won't think about that. But this exchange of ideas help us appreciate the problems that they face so that we have a better understanding of, that, uh, of different communities facing different types of STEM problems. They also have problems with things such as um, pigeons. Pigeons and their droppings causing damage to, to their local population. So they talk about bio, biologically friendly ways to keep pigeons away. They have bumper harvest of coconuts within a community. And one of the very interesting ideas is how do we make use of this coconut? How do we create fermentation products that will store, um, that will keep well in under hot weather conditions that are equally nutritious? So there are different problems which um, uh, different society and different cultures uh, face, and they create different problems for their students to understand and for them to learn. So the question is, what is the problem of your own community? And can you try to use these contemporary problems contemporary issues to help your students better understand the idea of integrated STEM. Now, integrated STEM um, has problems at the center most of the time because we want the students to solve authentic problems. In 2019, my team and I published a paper called the STEM Quartet Instructional Framework, where we tried to use this framework, we proposed this framework to help our teachers plan meaningful STEM lessons. Under the STEM Quartet Instructional Framework, we uh, have problem at the center, and this problem is not any types of problem, but rather, I'm just typing this in the chat, STEM Quartet Instructional Framework. You can download the paper, it's a free, it's an open access paper. 
Now, in the STEM Quartet Instructional Framework, we argue that um, while students' learning are rich in science, math, uh, engineering, and technology, if they come together, it makes it, if the four disciplines come together, the learning experiences of our students become more enriched. Just like a choir, the sopranos can sing and produce melodious music, the tenor as well. But when we have all the four parts coming together, we make a different sound. We make more beautiful music. So we have problem at the center. But these problems are not any type of problems. But rather, the problems have to fulfill three key conditions. And these three key conditions are that the problem has to be complex, it has to be persistent, and it has to be extended. I repeat, the problem must fulfill three key conditions, complex, persistent, and extended. Complex. What is a complex problem? We define a complex problem as one that requires students to apply knowledge from two or more of the four disciplines to solve. If it only requires science knowledge, then it's not a complex problem. It's just a science problem. It's not a STEM problem. All right, so it has to get two or more disciplines to solve. What is a persistent problem? A persistent problem is a problem whereby it won't go away once it is solved. Let me give you an example. A non-persistent problem is like a stuck door problem. The door is stuck. What can you do? You get the mechanic to come in, you change the hinge of the door, and then the problem goes away. The door is no longer stuck. That's not a persistent problem. A persistent problem is like our energy problem. While we have several solutions, the problem never goes away. We are still continuously trying to look for alternative uh, sources of energy, right? So that's a persistent problem. And of course, the last one is an extended problem. Um, in STEM learning, we are trying to argue for the fact that we, when we present students with the problems, it is not simple problems. Rather, it's problems that require students to be engaged with the activity for a prolonged period of time, not just five to 10 minutes, which is what we do when we give students, say, math homework, right? We give them a ton of problems and they can solve it within the hour. Uh, in STEM problems, we, we, we say that no, it has to, they have to spend about at least six hours trying to figure out what it is and trying to propose solutions to these problems. So with the STEM quartet, we got our teachers to start designing activities um, for the community, for their students. And then what the teachers came back to us and they say, you know what, Ikling, this is really hard. It's really difficult to do. Why? Because when they will present, when they present a problem, students can come up with different, different solutions. And they said that therein lies a problem because I want to map my lesson onto a set of learning outcomes. I want to be able to tick off my learning outcomes. But when it comes to problems, I can't do that. I can't do that simply because I don't know what solution students will generate. So, so let me give you an example. A teacher came to me and a teacher said, you know what, Igling? I love to teach my students the intelligent traffic light or the smart traffic light. So I use the smart traffic light to get our students to unpack and to learn about NAND gate, NOR gate, OR gate, and circuitry. And I said to the, to say to the teacher, but what problem does the intelligent traffic light solve? And the teacher says, well, mm, traffic jam. So I said, great, can you then phrase your uh, activity as a traffic jam, that there is a traffic jam outside uh, the school every day at seven in the morning. Uh, think of a way to solve the traffic jam problem. And the teacher said, no, I can't do that. I can't do that because the traffic jam can be solved by uh, a, a rule, uh, a, a law being passed that only mon on Mondays, only green cars can come to the school. So they don't actually need a STEM solution. They may not actually think of a, a intelligent traffic light. And if the student's proposal of a solution is not a traffic light, I can't teach them the NAND gate, NOR gate, or OR gate. And I thought, well, he's got a point, right? And if we want teachers to have agency, to have a voice, 
to be able to propose changes, we need to listen to these problems and difficulties that they face in the classroom. So one of the things that we did was we actually published another paper because uh, uh, we started to do research on what we call problem-centric and solution-centric STEM learning. In problem-centric, we start with a problem. In solution-centric, we start with a solution. The intelligent traffic light is a solution to a problem. So it becomes a design-based kind of STEM lesson. When they start with a solution, the students must learn the affordances or the understand how the solution works. What are some of the uh, areas for improvement, some of the gaps in the current solution? And then they will be asked to design 2.0. All right, they'll be asked to design 2.0. And in the design process, all right, in the design process, they, uh, they learn the content, the disciplinary knowledge, they learn the epistemic practices, of the four disciplines. So uh, we also published a, a paper, uh, a second part of the STEM quartet paper that talks about centricity of STEM, problem-centric STEM, user-centric STEM, and the last one we call it uh, problem-centric STEM, solution-centric STEM, and user-centric STEM. So we have these uh, different types of centricity, different versions coming in. Now, what have we found so far from this particular research? Uh, one of the things that we thought was that in problem-centric STEM, our students become more creative. They ask more questions. They have a richer learning experience. But our preliminary data suggests to us that that's not the case. Uh, that's not the case. In solution, when they start with the solution, which is a design-centric STEM, uh, they are actually more creative. All right, They ask uh, more uh, focused questions. Our hypothesis is that in problem-centric STEM, the cognitive load and the cognitive demand of the student is very high. Students were asking a lot of questions, trying to just make sense of the problem. They were trying to scope the problem. And, and so they, they use a lot of their time and effort to scope the problem, leaving them little time to be creative or innovative in the solution that were proposed. For the solu solution-centric, they, they are given the solution, they don't actually, they are given the solution, they have to think of an improved design for the solution. So with that, they don't actually spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the problem is. So it gives them, it frees up more time for them to be creative in version 2.0, for instance. So we are not advocating one method over the other. Rather, what we are trying to advocate is that depending on our students, students at different levels, will require different ways of approaching STEM. As a teacher, when I work together in a team, I will think, okay, my students are new. Maybe I will start with solution-centric. Once they are more familiar, I move towards more open-ended, problem-centric kind of STEM for the students. All right? Now, all these require strong leadership. I need, as a teacher in the classroom, I will need resources. I will need um, expert knowledge of my colleagues to come together. I will need time to plan. I will need time to also implement. So this requires good head of departments, enlightened principals who share the same vision of STEM learning before it can actually happen. So I hope that um, from today's sharing, you take away with you Three C's, culture and context, collaboration, courage for change. And in these three C's of leadership, we, we examine the agency. Uh, let, me, let me move back. We examine the agency, the identity, as well as the need to build a community. There are various activities that can help build this community and the community it's not built by people uh, belonging to the same discipline, but rather people belonging to different disciplines. So with that, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Tan, uh, for the nice talk and uh, sharing your insights about the problem. Uh, so now let's go into the question. Uh, so, 
So first of all, I have a question. Uh, in, in your teacher professional development program, uh, suppose for example, taking your example, if, if the student is asking uh, the traffic question to a biology teacher, uh, who doesn't know much about the gates? So like, what is the nature of the content training? Uh, like I, I understood that uh, your model provides like uh, uh, a winner is selected and further opportunities and avenues are provided for the teacher uh, to uh, uh, improve his or her scholarship. But are yeah. there like specifically focused uh, uh, training programs, for example, taking uh, problems which are of this nature, complex interdisciplinary problems, and uh, in a workshop-like setting, uh, they are trying to tackle it uh, like that. Are there such components in your workshop? Yes, so um, that's a really good question. Uh, one of the things that we do is like take the traffic light. The, we have in a STEM quartet instructional framework, we advocate for a lead discipline meaning that the lead discipline would be the teacher leading the team. So the traffic light problem would typically be led by a physics trained teacher. A physics trained teacher will take the lead in convening the team and in developing the resources together. So in the development process, everybody learns the content. I'm a biology teacher. I will learn from my colleagues. So this idea of a peer, peer teaching comes in and we build our knowledge base together. So if I have another problem that uh, say uh, diabetes, which is uh, more biology based content knowledge required, I'm a biology teacher, I will be the lead teacher. I will lead the team, that's the lead discipline to help uh, my teachers, uh, my team come together and learn the content. So that way um, we, we avoid the, oh, I know, I, I don't know anything about this. I can't do this. So we, the teams become very important. So uh, in this kind of collaborative uh, meetings, you develop modules around these kinds of things. That is the, okay. okay. Got it, that's got it. right. That's right. I think I see some questions yeah, yeah. on the chat. Yeah. We have the first question from Jasneet. Uh, you want me to read it out? Um, I think... Uh, how do industries in I can I can do it. Um, yes. how do industries intervene in this STEM professional? All right. So um, what we do is for each year we will invite some of our partners from the industry to give professional development talks and workshops uh, for our teachers, for our teachers who might be interested to be part of the program. So they come in. They this is part of their community outreach program. So they work with the teachers to uh equip them with um, some knowledge of um, that particular, you know, like say, for instance, last year we had clean energy. We got our partners from ExxonMobil to come in to talk about petroleum, to talk about the ubiquitous use of petroleum uh, in, or in, in plastics, in making uh, molecules, um, you know, different distillates of petroleum, in how it's being used in the industry, not just of uh, fuel to run, what are some of the difficulties that we face when we want to talk about moving away from fossil fuels? So this would be what the industry partners would share with the teachers, the knowledge that they have, uh, uh, the current knowledge, and they will work with the teachers on that. So I hope that um, gives you an idea of how industries intervene with the particular program. Um, the second question is to end, um, end up co-teaching courses as a result of their work with the program, not just splitting the course content, but being in the classroom together for all lessons. Uh, that's actually a really good question, uh, Sumitra. Um, different schools actually uh, operate slightly differently. So um, what they do actually is um, many schools have co-teachers, but they don't go into the classroom together, but rather they have a unit of work. So for instance, the science teacher, let's say this, this week we decided the math teacher and the science teacher will all talk about diabetes. The biology teachers talk about um, insulin and the hormones related to diabetes. The math teacher talks about how do we compute and measure and model um, uh, with the data provided somebody who might be pre-diabetic. All right, so the theme, the problem is the same, different teachers, 
uh, will cover the same thing, cover the same theme within their lessons. And at the end of uh, a week or two, then they will come together and solve a problem. So there will be individual disciplinary knowledge development and then finally culminate to a week where the teachers come together in the same classroom with the students to solve the problem. Now, that's not an easy thing to do because in terms of logistics, it's, it's quite challenging. And that's where the leadership needs to come in. The leadership needs to come in and say, look, we are ready to disrupt what we, ex what we do uh, uh, very well now in, in, in silos. All right, can we create this space for, for the teachers to all come together uh, to solve the problem? Yeah, the next um, question is quite close to that uh, regarding uh, opportunities for making mistakes. Uh, like, how do you create spaces for failure, particularly in Asian countries where there is immense societal pressure to achieve success? Yeah, that's, uh, I don't have the answer to that. Um, how do we, this is where the evaluation component needs to come in. Can leadership, uh, I agree totally, um, how do we create spaces to make uh, mistakes? Uh, it's, it's, it's a tough thing. It's a tough thing. Um, Manu, Manu Kapu in his research talks about productive failure. Uh, how do we actually create spaces deliberately and intentionally for students to make mistakes so that they can learn from their mistakes? Um, uh, trial and error, mm, it's expected that definitely. Um, so one of the things with STEM education, at least in Singapore, is that um, our Ministry of Education made sure that STEM, integrated STEM, is not an examinable subject. All right, it is not. It, there will be no exams, but rather the students will learn uh, in a manner that is non-threatening. All right. So it's a more Chaitanya sincere. Chaitanya also raised his hand. Sir. Do you want to speak, like uh, intervene, Chaitanya? It was his question. Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Hi, Prof Tan. Uh, Hi. Thank. Yeah. So I actually I wanted to uh, also get some idea about parents' responses to this because uh, for students, uh, I think it might be, they might be okay with making mistakes, but I think it's the parents' responses which play a huge role when where this idea of success and failure is concerned. So if yeah. you could speak a little bit about that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I think one of the things right now, we are at a stage, we're at crossroads where um, uh, we, we, we are positioning STEM learning not so much as a subject that you need to pass or you, where you need to take an exam before you can move up to a level, another level of, uh, of, of uh, school, but rather STEM uh, learning or STEM projects are positioned as part of an important portfolio building for the students. And so um, they, they, students can make mistakes, but rather because they keep a track of their learning, uh, they want to see, we want to see, we value progress progress in students' ideas, progress in uh, how their ideas have developed through time. Um, so, so right now, we don't have a lot of pressure from, from parents yet um, because uh, as long as it's not a national exam accountability, parents are, are less uh, edgy about it. So um, we are positioning this as... Um, they will make mistakes because that's how science is made. That's how mathematicians are work. That's, that's, those are the epistemic practices of this particular field of knowledge or field of learning. And so communication with the parents is yet another uh, thing that we are trying to uh, work on as well. Okay. Yeah. Next, thank you. Next question is from Sarita. Have you found that the teachers who participate in the competition also take up these STEM problems with the students over and above the regular curriculum? Yes, yes. Um, what, what happened was that the teachers in this particular competition uh, really uh, learned a lot. Um, they, they actually uh, use these ideas with their students. Um, sometimes some of them use it within their their core main curriculum, others do it outside um, their core curriculum. So we are seeing these teachers trying to experiment with these ideas because they truly believe in the value 
of integrated STEM. So in Singapore, there is a centralized curriculum. Uh, everyone has to follow like... Yes, yes. Okay. We do have a standardized curriculum. Okay. Uh, the next one is from Zenith. Uh, could you please elaborate on user-centric STEM? Okay. Right. So maybe I can share screen. Just uh, share screen. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me share uh, a screen on a user centric STEM. Right. So, so these are the three STEM. So we started out with a problem. Problem at the center where we have S T E and M and the problem solving around it. Then we talk about um solution centric STEM, which is solution at the center within the context of a problem multiple iterations of a solution to make it better and better. And the last one is actually the user as a center. This has got resemblance or this has got certain characteristic of design thinking coming in where we, we look at what's the need of a user. The difference between the user-centric STEM and uh, design thinking is that um, design thinking uh, talks about empathy with a larger population. Uh, in user-centric STEM, we identify the needs of individual user. So it can be a problem. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. It can be a solution, a solution that works for most people. But this solution is not good for that specific user because of a certain unique need of that user. So one of the things we wanted our students to do is to understand the specific need of the user and then try to Think of how you can improvise new solutions for this specific user. So for instance, uh, we had our students design a uh, car plate tracking system for their school. And then the, they, they were supposed to implement it with the security personnel tracking car, cars going in and out of the school. So this group of students were really good with uh, uh, coding, you know, Python, etc. And they created a solution really, really well. And they were very excited. So they, they handed it over to the security personnel. But after a week, the security personnel didn't use the system. And then they were disappointed. So one of the, so the teacher very skillfully told the, the, the kids to say, you know what, let me arrange for a meeting with the security personnel to get them to, to have a dialogue with you. And they did. And so they asked them, why aren't you using the system that we created? And the security personnel said, well, you know what? We are old. Many of our security people are, are old elderly. The phones are so small, we had no idea what to click. It was as simple as that. This, the, the kids went back and they said, oh dear, what should we do? So they start to create this big icon, you know, this red, big red button, and they numbered it one, two, three. And so they, told, they, they went back and they, they told the security personnel, you click one, then you click two, and then you click three. You just need to look at this big number. And so um, when they did that, they started to use the system. And when we interviewed the students afterwards and asked them what was the most impactful part of this learning process, they said it was the dialogue with the security personnel. So they understand that user experience is important, right? They don't, a solution is not a solution unless the user uses it, the user knows. So you need to first understand what are the issues with the user. So that's a user-centric STEM that we are talking about in, in short. Hope that helps. I, thank you. Uh, thank you. I have one last question. In a centralized system, there are different layers of leadership, right? For example, I mean, it, it, the situation gets complex as the size of the country increases. Uh, so for example, in, for, in a country like India, what the decision taken by uh, at the central, at the uppermost uh, in the hierarchy, that has the most constraining impact on the whole system, but they are the uh, farthest away from the ground reality of classroom. Yes. So this kind of uh, uh, lack of connection between different layers of leadership and uh, how, how does your model take into account that? Even right. though um, the teacher decides, there may be other factors. That definitely, I, I think that's an excellent question. Uh, what our model tries to do is, um, it tries to, uh, I don't think our model can account for 
uh, the highest level of leadership and how it cascades downwards. Um, it, it, it will not be able to explain that. But rather, what we hope our model does is add a more Um, we cannot change the exam system, right? We cannot change the exam system. So that is something we cannot consider and we, we will not. Uh, but rather what we can do is can we create other spaces outside the exam? Okay, so um, uh, that's, that's something we can continue to consider with, with our leadership thing, with, with um, bigger systems. How does it work? Yeah. Okay, uh, we will... Uh, there's one more comment from Vishal, and with that, we can uh, close the session. Uh, he want to understand how industries like Exxon Mobile, uh, Mobil, who are active funders in climate change denial, and one of the major polluters can be invited to talk on clean energy, when climate change and clean energy are one of the biggest scientific problems to be solved. Thank you for that. I think that's... Uh... That's a contentious uh, uh, debate that we are having as well, even within our local community. Um, when we wanted to work with ExxonMobil, uh, within ourselves, we also had a lot of debates uh, whether or not to, to, be, uh, to invite them as partners. Um, one of my colleagues said, you know what, we shouldn't. We shouldn't do that. They are greenwashing, you know, um, and, and these sort of debates. Um, but I think at the end of the day, we decided that there still needs to be a dialogue. Uh, demonizing, um, demonizing um, industries, uh, fuel industries, uh, it does not mean that um, the problem will go away. But rather, how can we make use of what they are doing to seek to better understand why they are doing that and how we can play our part as active citizens um, to use less energy, etc. Um, so I think a dialogue is the way forward. And so uh, that's why uh, we have them coming in as partners. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Tan, for the nice talk and uh, patiently answering all our questions. Uh, let's join our hands together to uh, thank Professor Tan uh, for the nice talk she has given and for the time. Thank you, thank Professor you. Tan. Thank you very much and uh, appreciate the, this opportunity. Have a wonderful conference. Thank you.